Thanks, Dan. So, uh, welcome everybody this morning. Um, as you mentioned before, my name is Lars. Um, I want you to come originally together with my colleague, uh, Rob Bowie. But he's preparing for a talk in Ottawa, so he can't be here today. I'm working quasi um, at, the, at the next uh, building, uh, the new facility of the National Research Council Institute for Fuel Cell Innovation. And as the name suggests, we're working on fuel cells. So today it's going to show you what fuel cells are and why we're developing them and what this is all about. Before we start, let's take a look at this little guy here. I've got the real one um, right in front of me. It's something that we call direct methanol fuel cell. And I will I'll come into the details later today. I'm just going to show you how these things work. And it takes about half an hour before anything happens here. So let's uh, fill it up right now to, to show you how this um, a very simple technology what, what, what simple technology fuel cells really are. And so we take a bottle of methanol, just normal alcohol, and um, squirt it in here. And that's everything there really is. On one side we've got the container with our alcohol, and on the other side there's just air. And now that I've just filled it in, let's see what happens if we flip the switch. What happens? Nothing. Nothing. Perfectly. So, we're going to let it sit here, and in about half an hour, I hope that something's going to happen. And um, the methanol is supposed to penetrate the, the, the um, surface area and wet all the catalyst, and it takes about half an hour. So I do it in the very beginning. So my talk today is going to be three, three parts. We really want, first of all, why do we really uh, develop the fuel cells? And then what alternative fuels can we use on those and why? And then I'm going to go into some details of the research that we're doing. I bought it. Now this is going to be a little lecture on what's actually happening to our climate at the moment. We could just sit on the beach and everything's perfectly fine. But um, <clears throat> There were recent reports, uh, most notably, notably the Stern report in the UK, that talked about the, the economics of climate change impact. And he said that about 1% of the global, the global gross domestic product has to be invested right now every year in order to prevent mass damage of our, of our economies in the order of 20% uh, loss of GDP permanently, which would mean major recession. And there's not only uh, economic reasons um, that we would have to think about some alternative technologies to, to um, burning fossil fuels. There's access to fuel, clean water, food, um, all those kind of things, health issues, and then major flooding that will be happening. And the examples given in the report, one of them is uh, Bangladesh will basically vanish. And our, the recent example was just Jakarta basically being flooded. It's one of the pictures there. The impact period that we're looking at in, uh, in terms of global warming, we sort of we emit not only CO2 but all kinds of stuff when we burn fossil fuels that basically heats up our atmosphere and that doesn't only influence us for the next 50 years, it will probably influence us much, much longer. So we have, um, even if you stop CO2 emissions within the next 50 years, it will still stabilize over the next 100 to 300 years. Then we'll probably melt our, um, our ice caps and um, glaciers. That's going to happen over hundreds of years. And then the sea level is going to rise just by expanding it from the, from the increased uh, warmth. And that's going to be over the land, yeah. <coughs> so what does it mean? We are all living in Vancouver. Well, sort of, uh, if you look at that, oops, uh, that picture. This thing there. Um, that's from the Sierra Club Canada. Uh, country. It's, it, it, it's about an estimate of 6 to 25 meters raised in sea level. I doubt it's somewhat the 25 meters, but 6 meters is definitely possible. And if you look at that map, sort of where we sit, Vancouver, it's fine. If you live in Richmond, <laughs> learn how to swim. Uh, most of the, of the, of the more lower mainlands are not above 6 meters above the sea level, and that's going to be a problem when the sea level is going to be higher than this today. So, um, uh, going further, the, um, the normal price uh, per here, uh, Dr. Smalley, he estimated uh, that the 10 biggest problems that face our society today 
first one of them is energy. All the others can more or less directly be related to energy. So we have to do something about that. Water, access to water, clean water has to be dug out of the ground, cleaned, stored, pumped into your house. Food, if you want to eat our kiwis, they have to be shipped halfway around the world. Environment, poverty, war, we have to don't have to fight wars about it. Uh, access to, to uh, fossil fuel sources, diseases. That's a very interesting one. Does anybody know where um, like uh, medicines and all that come from? If they're not made from plants, they're usually made from petrol products. Which means that A, if petrol is getting really expensive, not all the medicines get really expensive or no longer available. And uh, those kind of things. The um, uh, something that we call it the terawatt challenge. That's what, where our society is at the moment. If you look at the left picture, we use about 14 terawatts, a little bit of energy worldwide, and we are about 6.3 billion people. Projected to 2050, we will be about 10 billion people, and then we will use between 30 and 60 terawatts, more likely on the higher end of that estimate, or even more. And we have to change our um, Usage. Uh, our, our main basis is oil, and oil is just the most, most potent fuel available these days. Talk about it in a second. And um, it's just, it will get more scarce and more expensive because we have to change our, uh, our fuel usage to other types. So, uh, wind, geothermal, well, I'll um, emphasize that a little bit more in a second. But let's just not only focus on the, uh, on the uh, CO2. Yeah, Not only climate change, there's also anti-climate change. And I'm just show you this head. There's something in these pictures you can't see. It's essential to life. Carbon dioxide. Okay. We call it life. 